from Microbe TV. This is Immune, episode number 64, recorded on January 17th, 2023. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast about the body's defenders against disease. Joining me today from Ithaca, New York, Cindy Leifer. Hi, welcome back. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. That's right. Yeah, our right. first This is our first epitope one. of 2023. <laughs> epitope. Also, so joining us from Cleveland, Ohio, Steph Langle. Hey there. Great to be back. Yep. Happy New Year. It's wild. Another year. It's gone by. And from Madison, New Jersey, Brianne Barker. Hi, great to be here. Happy New Year. Ready to start another great year of immune. So I was trying to explain the immune system to someone who <laughs> knows nothing. And I said, "It, the immune system is the body's defenders against disease. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> good I think it's a good tagline, right? Yep. Yeah. It's a really yeah. good tagline. All right, since everyone loved our potpourri, right, last time? We did get good reviews on that, and it was fun. I liked it. It It was a good time. We decided to do it again. So we we each have a handful of papers. Not quite a handful. A handful would be five, I guess. Two to three. Two Two to three papers, and we will chat about. So let's, without further ado, as they say in the business, let's get going, and let's start with you, Cindy. Yeah. So, okay. So I picked two papers today. One, I think um, Steph might might be interested in. We'll get to that one second. Um, I, I tackled probably things that I um, a little bit, I'm not qualified for. <laughs> it's above my pay grade, but we'll see how I can do. So the first one I called a tangled web of wires. So this is a, <laughs> it's a very complicated paper, but it is a really, really cool paper. So the title of the paper is A Physical Wiring Diagram for the Human Immune System. Um, This was published in Nature. Um, The first author is Jared Schiltz. And the the last author is Gavin Wright. Now, I did not look to see whether or not there are multiple first and last authors on this. But I would not be surprised because it is a pretty crazy, deep... um, I called it the um, throwing the kitchen sink of cutting edge technologies at a problem. Uh, so, so this is really interesting. So, what, so what is the problem that they're trying to tackle in this paper? And the idea here is that um, the immune system is really uh, a series of cell-cell interactions. And they can either be cells secreting something and another cell responding, or frequently the surface of two cells need to interact for various different things. This can include cell trafficking, antigen presentation, the way T cell cytotoxic T cells will recognize their targets, attach to them and kill them. And so there's lots and lots of these cell surface cell cell interactions. And we actually don't know that much about those interactions. And so what they did was they wanted to take a large-scale approach to do this, so a huge, giant screen. But the screens are problematic because um, the the proteins that interact are usually not very high affinity, so they're really hard to screen. They developed this, um, so, so basically they're saying there's an underrepresentation of a lot of these interactions and knowledge about them because of this low affinity, or they don't usually work in typical screens because they are transmembrane proteins. So how do they how do they do this? So they developed this this mm. platform that they call scalable arrayed multivalent extracellular interaction screen or Cevexis. <laughs> I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but basically they're going to analyze multiple. Uh, um, interactions. So they made a library of 630 biotinylated surface proteins. So they, they're prob- not the full protein. They can't get the transmembrane domain, but the, the interaction domain that's outside of cells. So 630 of them. Different and they made the, so different 630 proteins. different ones. Now may they made them both as a bait and as a prey. So what does this mean? This means when you're going to do a screen, you have to put something on a plate um, and that's your bait, and then you incubate it with something, and that's your prey. And so this is a bait, pr- 
bait prey interaction. And they use a uh, strip Davidin to, to facilitate all of this. And they make each one of these recombinant proteins individually in a human cell. So that has all the right glycosylations and post-translational modifications, everything that it needs. Okay. So they put these on the plate and then they screen with all of the other 630. So they screen 630 with 630. So 630 baits with 630 mm. prey. So we'll get every possible interaction. It's crazy. It's so, crazy. <clears throat> yeah, so they test all the possible interactions, and then they do secondary screens to confirm them. And basically, they have a, a false positive rate below 1 in 10,000. So these are, these are really cool. You know, they identified a lot of known interactions, as one would predict, but they identified 28 new interactions um, that they had never seen before. And so they they knew what were things that were interacting before by they did a huge giant curation of the literature. So this was another giant aspect of this paper. And they took basically and did screens and, and PubMed searches for different terms and things and curated all of the known surface interactions with the 630 proteins that they made. So... Their screen basically increased our known interactions by 20%. So it doesn't sound like a whole lot, but that's actually quite that's a bit. A lot. Yeah, it's quite a bit. And they know this was cool because they identified, for example, novel ligands for orphan receptors. So there's a checkpoint receptor, uh, checkpoint immune checkpoint receptor called VISTA. And they found that non-classical MHC molecules, HLA-E and HLA-F, interact with that. So that's a cool finding. Um and anyway, so so the other another cool thing that they found was that in immune receptors, fifty seven percent of these receptors have a unique binding pair. That means they only bind one other protein. So mm -hmm. the the specificity of interaction is really high, right? Um, but we know that there are a bunch of proteins that interact with a lot of other things in the immune system too. So, so there are some that are gen more generalists and some that are specific ones. And the specific ones are, as one would predict, primarily related to signaling, right? So, you know, if you're going to respond to a ligand and signal, you don't want to respond to 10 different ligands, right? Because then the specificity is gone. So what are some of the cool technologies that they use to kind of validate all of this and, and provide more information about these interactions? So one is they use surface plasma on resonance, which one would expect them to use, right? You can take a recombinant protein, you put it on plate, and you can in real time determine the binding, the on rates and the off rates and find the affinities of all these interactions. So they did this on a one-on-one -on -one basis to to support that these are dynamic interactions. And one of the things that they found, another cool thing that they found was that when the, the, the cells are not activated or you're in a non-inflammatory state, the affinity of the protein-protein interactions is low. So you have a, a preference of expressing proteins that in general have low affinity interactions. And then when you're in an inflamed state, it the cells switch to preferentially expressing proteins that have high affinity interactions. And if you think about it, it makes sense because if you're in a non-inflamed state, you want to be really dynamic. You want to be able to interact, move around, respond to multiple things. But once you're in an inflamed environment, you kind of want to nail things together and really um, in, induce whatever responses you're going to have, whether it be antigen presentation or you know, T-cell interaction. So, th so those are a couple of things that they found. Um, I'm putting in the show notes the atlas that they have so you can screen and um, digitally and look for interactions and do multiple kinds of analyses on, on their data set. But um, another, uh, another thing they kind of did was, um, so, so throwing this kitchen sink of, of things are um, looking at um, the recurring motifs um, to look at hubs of interactions. So what they found, for example, were myeloid cells were really hubs of interaction across multiple cellular interaction networks. So if you think about one particular cell and all of the different types of cells it can interact with and communicate with in the immune system, the myeloid cells seem to be the, the hubs of everything mm -hmm. that's happening. So uh, across multiple different tissues, they, they calculated this thing called a centrality score. So it's this idea of how many different nodes come out of one particular cell type. 
Mm-hmm. And so the, the myeloid cells have connections with the most different kinds of cells. And so they're kind of the initiators and organizers of the, the response. And so they also are saying that they adapt to um, the local tissue niches and integrate all of the information to be able to, and, and to do that, they need to express all these different kinds of receptors that connect them to other cells. Hmm. That's incredible. And monocytes. So what we can assume based on the screen is that these these are proteins that could be expressed by the monocytes or they could be proteins that the monocytes are responding to. We, well, yep, they're we both. So, yes, so I mean, they like, are, we don't know right. which way. We know that it could be either. Right. So the their screen identified protein-protein interactions, right? So the monocyte could be expressing something that it's using to communicate with other cells. Mm-hmm. And it also could be expressing things that it's using to gain information from other cells. And it's probably a combination of both. So, Sandy, do you think this is all right? <laughs> I, I mean, you know, there's probably some, uh, you know, bias and a little bit of, of you know, over-interpretation here and there. But I think it, I, I think it's pretty robust that they made rec- individual recombinant proteins. I mean, this is an incredible amount of work, right? Individual recombinant proteins and then looked at the, all of the other proteins that they would interact with. And so and th- I'm not sure how else one could do that other than that protein-protein interaction. Right. And so you mentioned that there's not going to be transmembrane domains that these proteins are associated with. And so I could envision where, okay, you have your own pathway that you study. You yep. see a protein that is interacting with a protein you've never seen before. Okay, now you could take that information into your system where then you could look at downstream signaling, which are likely going to matter. So a critique of this paper could be, well, you know, that's... that. These are generated Mm -hmm. interactions based on recombinant proteins that may not express the same in the human body, but it's a window into what could be happening and then you have to validate it. Yeah, right. I think that's the key. People Mm -hmm. will need to do experiments to to validate because if you remember uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, people were doing these kinds of interacting experiments with all the SARS-CoV-2 proteins Mm -hmm. and pulled out a lot of stuff which turned out not to be of any interest. So uh, it's it, it seems like they have done different things here, which is useful, but I think still you need to validate a lot of this. Absolutely. Yeah, sure. You could probably also imagine that maybe if two proteins needed to be together for the, for an interaction, that that wouldn't show up in this kind of sure, screen. they're going to miss things, um, absolutely. You could imagine how you could do that in a next screen, but that would be so many... Yeah. Combinations. Combinations. But yeah, it's the great other the other thing it misses. Them. Yeah, the other thing it misses is the changes in affinity that happen from coalescing receptors, right? So if mm-hmm. there's one on one binding, that's one thing. But if there's clustering of receptors, there's that changes receptors, yeah. the interaction. And we know that clustering is critical for immune cell interactions, right? So we have the um, the uh, how what are they called? Why am I blanking on this? Where the T cell and the rat? Yeah, no, the um, synapses. Yeah, yeah, the synapses of interaction where you get those rings with the um, yeah. integrin interaction and then T cell receptor and MHC in the middle, and so you get this uh, really organized. Um, coalescing of specific Smacks. receptors, SMACs, that's it. Um, mm. Super mm-hmm. molecular activation motif, it's, yeah, something like that. Yeah. yeah. So, so that so you have an influence of interaction of certain proteins on other proteins, especially things like integrins and adhesion molecules, that will change how other receptors interact in in, in um, three dimensions, right, on a cell surface. But this provides still, I think, a nice. Um, library of things to start to look at. So if you identify these new motifs, that are, these new protein-protein interactions, then like Vincent said, you could go and take your favorite protein and, and see if you can validate it in vitro and see in vivo what kind of, of uh, role it might play in the immune system. Very cool. Pretty cool. Yeah, good stuff. All right. Steph, what do you have for us? Sure. So my picks are reflective of the last couple of weeks that I have had. I I think I've shared with a couple of you, but I had an experience with my son who he's two and a half, a little older than two and a half. And 
we had gone through acute respiratory infections. He's a daycare kid. So that makes sense. We had mm. recovered, had a great Christmas, but around New Year's Eve we had started to experience fevers, not eating and drinking. And what was really obvious was these huge swelling of his lymph nodes and his face. I mean, he really was very uncomfortable, couldn't lay down, couldn't sleep. And I think the dehydration is what urgent care said. Okay. If he doesn't get better, you need to go to the ER because this is not something mm. that we can deal with here. And so we were admitted to the hospital and after multiple days, days of determining what the different diagnostics were. For sure, he had strep, group A streptococcal infection in his respiratory tract. And that is going to be my first pick. I'll talk a little bit about that. And it's a fascinating bacterium. But the second diagnosis was Epstein-Barr virus, which causes infectious mononucleosis. And it was this co-infection that was causing him many problems. And he was not able, at least <laughs> at our time, of going to the hospital to control it himself. And so it was a very... Um, obviously emotional experience, right? You have this like little baby in the hospital and you you don't know. I mean, before the EBV diagnosis, there were conversations about cancer. This is, this is how a head or neck cancer could look after a bacterial infection. Um, And so these are just pathogens that we do not have vaccines for. They are, can just the mechanisms of actions are wild. And so that being on the patient side of the healthcare setting when you're in research is just such a profound experience. And I've just, it makes you very thankful for like all the things that happen to make sure like your kid can survive. So it just, for me, that was a very, uh, a very, uh, I will not forget that experience. Yeah. So that leads me to my first paper, which is going to be a review. And I'll just talk about how did I, Okay, so this is a new field for me. I'm not very familiar with group A streptococcal infections. I study viruses. Bacteria freak me out. They're huge. (laughs) They can survive outside of cells. You know, their genomes are like thousands of times the size of a viruses. So I wanted to know more about GAS or group A streptococcal infections. Who are the leaders in this field? And I would just be curious also to hear how you guys, how you all um, do your uh, PubMed searches, like what is your protocol to find out who are the people in this field? Like what are the reviews I need to learn to, to get to, to learn more about this? And what I do in, and this just for our audience, if you're curious, I could use PubMed. I actually find PubMed to be a very inefficient way for me to find things quickly. A Google search of a cell nature science review paper, because those journals are going to be soliciting reviews from investigators who are experts in that field. So that's, I like to start there. It's not to say cell nature science are like the only journals that you can find good info, but I find when I'm trying to quickly understand a field and know who the experts are, that that's how I kind of start. The other thing to know about group A streptococcal infections is that they are not a uh, disease that has a very wide market share for vaccine development, which is very sad. There are many diseases like this where they mostly are killing people not in high-income countries where the majority of research and companies are located. So what you will find with diseases like this, I study one, rotavirus, is you will find philanthropy groups like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the WHO, which will commission these very large reviews and They will usually be synopses of meetings they've had to discuss, okay, what are the vaccine candidates? What are the the proteins we're going for? But then how do we put these in low middle income countries? How do we cheaply make this vaccine and and all these different factors that are challenges to, to developing a vaccine? So the paper that I have, I'm gonna post. Um, Do I have it? I actually don't have it pulled up. I wanna give you the, authors here. Um, it's in Clinical Infectious Diseases from 2019. The first author is Johan Vekamens and the last author is David Caslow. And so this is a summary from the WHO and people who work in um, at PATH, which I, I think PATH is a part of Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. I would have might be corrected on that. But again, philanthropy groups, um, tropical disease, infectious disease groups. And and what I learned from this review is that group A streptococcal infections are killing 500,000 people worldwide. Um, It can cause a variety of problems. In younger children, it 
it presents the way my son presented. These are in the nasopharynx, in the upper respiratory tract, but they can also cause um, skin infections, cellulitis. They can cause something called rheumatoid rheumatic heart disease. Mm. Particularly, um, there is a, a, a target in the M protein on group A strep <laughs> that has a similarity to uh, a self antigen. And so that's what they think is driving um, rheumatic heart disease. It can also cause gl- glomerulitis and um, is really a huge burden. The particular problem with group A strep is this wide diversity of this EMM gene that produces the M protein. And there are over 50 different serotypes. And the serotypes differ whether you're in a high income country or a low burden disease country. Or and so a, can I ask you a question? Yes, so absolutely. So that, that brings me to, to two questions. The first one is we, we hear strep throat. And mm-hmm. is this the organism that causes that? And then the second thing is, do, do the deaths that occur from this, are they because of lack of access to appropriate antibiotics? Or do we think that they are these different species, these 50 different or serotypes of group A strep that cause the differences in morbidity and mortality? Right. So group A strep is one of the bacterium that can cause strep throat. Group B strep is a little bit different, but it is, yes. So group A strep is one of the ones that causes strep throat. Now, the death... Is it specific species, pyogenes? So that is a different strep. So, okay. Yeah. So that I was looking at, yes, that is a different streptococcal. I don't, I don't know if it's caused, uh, I'm so into the virus world of variants and strains. I guess it's a different... Py- pyogenes does cause some strep okay. throat. Yeah. So he did not have that, or maybe they would have had to subtype him to find that out, but that Mm -hmm. is a particularly virulent strain Mm -hmm. of strep. The deaths are dependent on the disease and that's dependent on the age group you're in. So what is on the rise and we, we can put the CDC, um, the the CDC just put out kind of a warning, but the, there is a rise in invasive group A strep, which can cause toxic shock syndrome, necrotizing mm-hmm. fasciitis, cellulitis. And, and so depending on what age group you're in can determine the, the type of um, disease you have. I think the problem also with group A strep is that, of course, there's the acute things are happening in, in the next two weeks and you have to get antibiotics in these children or older adults. But the, the rheumatoid... Um, problem. The the autoimmune problem can be a decade after. Mm. And so to develop a vaccine against a clinical outcome that can be very far in the future is is very challenging. So mm-hmm. um so yeah, so that I I will that would be my this is my first it's really a review of of everything regarding development of vaccines and why it is so challenging and that um there are no correlates of protection. We we assume mm. that both antibodies and T cells play a role. Um, and when we come back around, I have a, a specific paper about that. But um, yeah, group A strep. It is. It's it's interesting when it affects you, and you're you're like, I need to know everything about group A strep, yeah. and, and why don't can, we have a vaccine? Can I ask you another question? And that is, yeah. um, you you say you don't like the bacteria because they're big and they can live outside of cells and things. Because we talk a lot about <laughs> viruses that require, you know, they have to live inside a cell, but some bacteria live outside of cells and others live. Mm happily inside cells, for example, like macrophages. Um, is this one that will just persist in extracellular environment or does it invade specific cells within the body? So when I was looking at that question, they said that they can do both, mm-hmm. that this bacterium can live outside. It can uh, replicate in just the interstitial space um, and connective tissue, but it can also replicate inside cells as well. So... Making, I think, particularly problematic if it is this invasive strep A, which I think the determinant of that would be your immune system at the local site cannot control it, and then it can move outside into extracell, you know, um, tissues outside of like liver respiratory tract, for example. So, Steph, yeah, Steph you're not going to be able to answer this, but do you think both infections were required at daycare or mm-hmm. both daycare and home, right? Yeah. So, I think daycare could have definitely been a route. 
we had Christmas, we had family over, we're mm. all eating, drinking together, you know. Kiss, kissing the baby, right? The only grandkid, everyone's loving on him. So yeah. it, it could have been a combination of of all of those things and, and Epstein-Barr virus, which will be a pick on, we circle back around to, but, you know, that is a virus that is transmitted through saliva. It's not typically, yeah. I mean, toddlers can get it up to, many times, but it doesn't often cause the type of maybe symptoms that we saw, but I think it was the dual infection that, that did that. That's a great point because, you know, multiple infections often give you outcomes that you don't see with single. Right, right. right. Mm-hmm. And, you know, with the with the correlation with Epstein-Barr virus and lupus, I, I'm looking at the correlations of multiple Epstein-Barr virus infections in children yeah. and the increased risk of lupus. Um, so, right. yeah, yeah. All right. Thanks for letting Thank me you. share. Yep. Brian, what do you have for us? Uh, so the first paper that I wanted to talk about is actually part of a pair, but I, I can talk <laughs> about them separately, um, that were published together in Nature Immunology in December. Um, and so they're from um, two groups or a group that has worked together. Um, there were some overlapping authors, uh, but the first one is called um, Pan Vaccine Analysis reveals innate immune endotypes predictive of antibody responses to vaccination. Mm. Um, the first author is Forati, and the last author is Rafiq Pierre Cycli. And what these uh, authors have done is they wanted to determine if they could find a um, immune profile that was related to making a good, an- a good response to vaccines. Um, and specifically, when they say a good response to vaccines, they're looking at um, antibody <laughs> levels. Um, so that's certainly a question that you know somebody could ask in the future. It was something about you know T cells or other than antibodies, but they've, they're looking at antibodies here. And in this paper, they have used a um, data set um, that is available. So basically, they're using um, this uh, transcriptomic data. F- um, the immune signatures data resource, um, where a lot of people um, submit a lot of different transcriptomics mm. data. And here they've gone through to look at um, responses to vaccines. Um, they have 820 adults, um, and they ha- are looking at responses to 13 different vaccines. Mm. And depending on the study that this came from, they have um, pre-vaccine, they have day zero, um, they have different time points after vaccination, um, sometimes even in hours after vaccination, and they also have um, about a month afterwards. And so all of this is just in this database, um, and they've mined uh, the database. And um, what they first decided to do was just look and see um, at baseline if they could group people into kind of different immune types. Um based on their transcriptomic data. And they were able to sort of realize that there were these three groups, what they called the three endotypes, um, in the people that they looked at. Uh, One thing that they did, this was sort of my first question in reading this, was that they looked at those endotypes um, in their individuals over time and saw that these were relatively stable. So it wasn't as if you were in a particular endotype because you got infected with something the day before. Mm-hmm. Um, the, these um, were persistent different endotypes um, that their individuals fell in. And this wasn't looking dependent at their- on what type of vaccine they got because I noticed that they have live vaccines, inactivated vaccines, like a conjugate vaccine. So all different types of platforms of vaccines mm-hmm. too, right? Yeah, they, they use different types of platforms in this one and in the other uh, paper as well. That kind of is more important than the other paper. Um, because here, really what they are thinking about is what was your immune response like before vaccination? And then is there some relationship to your antibody response? Mm-hmm. So can we find people who are going to be particularly good antibody responders? Could we predict based on um, transcript levels here? And the other paper, they look at sort of what the early immune response data looks like and how that relates to the antibody mm-hmm. levels. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so. And so what they've uh, what they do is they find these three groups, um, the high inflammatory, um, mid inf- 
medium inflammatory and low inflammatory groups. Um, the high inflammatory groups <clears throat> largely have a lot of innate immune uh, genes, as you might expect. They see more kind of B and T cell related uh, transcripts in the low inflammatory group. And then the middle group, as you might expect, is in between. Um, and they even uh, really find that there are about 14 genes that seem to distinguish That's which amazing. of the three groups wow. um, the individuals were in. Um, and so they have uh, their list of uh, these three groups, or these 14 genes. Um, and then they look at what happens um, following vaccination in uh, people of these three endotypes to see, did your immune endotype before vaccination influence what type of response you had? When they looked at innate immune genes, they saw a relative, a larger response in the people who were of the low inflammatory phenotype. Mm -hmm. They were sort of at the low level of inflammation. It went up a bunch, went up a lot, and then came back down. For those who were at the high inflammatory phenotype, they didn't see much of an increase. Mm -hmm. um, and that's interesting. But then when they also went ahead and looked at antibody responses, um, they saw that there was a dramatic difference in the antibody responses in those people who were the high inflammatory hmm. response uh, hmm. group. So the group who had high inflammatory responses at the beginning made the highest antibody responses. Huh. Um, and it's, even though they didn't have that big increase um, in immune response, inflammatory response with the vaccine. They were already sort of at a higher basal It's very interesting. And so to you, does that suggest that those innate immune mediators are there at high levels for the dendritic cells to respond to as they're presenting antigen, for the B cells to respond to? Like the, the mediators you need are kind of there at high levels so that they facilitate the response? That was sort of what they were implying. And that's kind of what I was thinking as well. Um, is that they were able to really start to prime that innate or the adaptive immune response with a good inflammatory response that was already underway. It's very, so they're it's, trained. It's very, yeah, and it's very counterintuitive in some yeah. ways because uh, there's a lot of conversation about low-level inflammation or, or medium-level inflammation being very detrimental to your health mm -hmm. and your immune response. And so I think it just highlights that <clears throat> that is very nuanced too. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but I, what they were, a, what they would want to be able to do with this is they want to be able to say, okay, can we predict mm -hmm. if someone is mm -hmm. going to be a good or bad responder? Mm -hmm. And if we know that having a particular inflammatory phenotype going into a vaccine is good, um, could we use adjuvants to improve how certain vaccines will work. Mm -hmm. Can we say, oh, um, this individual has the, amino or the endotype that um, predicts they would have a low vaccine response. Let's give them some extra adjuvant mm -hmm. um, to try to shift the responses that they're making. Which the elderly are, are the older part, that's already a group that we know has low levels of these. Yeah, exactly. Right. Um, this, was, this only looked at 18 to 55 year olds. Sure. Okay. Um, but they did stratify based on things like um, time points, age, vaccine platform, all of that. And they really didn't see big differences. Did they see sex differences? Because that's also um, well I, described, right? I, I don't see that the in there. No. no, they didn't look? They, I don't think they saw them. Oh, okay. That's a little surprising because we tend to think of yeah, yeah, women yeah. as a higher level yeah. of basal inflammation and more inflammatory. So they have a higher propensity for uh, autoimmune inflammatory diseases and tend to have a more robust response. It's just kind of opposite. They, of what they, they didn't. Say. So what I'm seeing here is they didn't see a um, association between sex and which endotype okay. someone was in. Um, but that's really the main way that they report. I see, but um, it may not have been the case. I mean, it may have been the case that they did, they would have seen sex differences if they were just looking at antibody levels, but specifically the endotype is what you're speaking right. to. Okay. Right, right. Um, and so uh, they also tried to figure out were these differences in transcriptomics related to different subsets of mm -hmm. cells. Um, and in fact, they found that some of the subsets of cells looked pretty similar. So it was that cells were transcribing different things. Hmm. 
Uh, although they were they were largely myeloid cells, but those myeloid cells were doing different amounts of transcription. It wasn't that people had dramatically different numbers of myeloid cells. So is this uh, going to be useful one day when you're born and your genome and your transcriptomes are determined and they say, ah, you're going to be a poor vaccine responder. We're going to do this, <laughs> <laughs> whatever this is, right? Yeah, I, I don't know if I would do it when you were born. Yeah. Um, one of the things that they mention is that they don't know with the endotypes are, say, related to lifestyle or diet or other types of factors. Yeah. But I could certainly imagine before getting a vaccine, yeah. um, mm -hmm. you could uh, have these 14 genes examined um, to determine if you're a good or potentially a good or bad responder yeah. Yeah. Um, and maybe get a different vaccine. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, that's very cool. Yeah. Very cool. I like that. All right. Speaking of inflammation, so I have I have a couple of papers here, and uh, I, I'm much much too uh, ambitious here. I don't, uh, <laughs> so I will just try and do my best. The first is science immunology class switch towards non-inflammatory spike specific IgG four antibodies after repeated SARS-CoV two mRNA vaccination, and uh, <clears throat> this is from a group, m multiple groups uh, over in Germany. Mainly, corresponding author is um, well. We got a couple. It doesn't matter. We can go look at them. This is a paper that got a lot of press attention yeah, it did. recently because the anti-vaxxers took it as evidence that the mRNA vaccines are bad, <laughs> which is totally, which is totally <laughs> ridiculous, right? Poor IgG4. It's like, yep. wait, what? Just because yeah. I'm here, I, it's bad? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, you know, it's it's less inflammatory for various reasons we'll, we'll try and discuss. Mm -hmm. And so they said, oh, look, it's less inflammatory than IgG1. So that's why it's bad. But in fact, we have no idea what the impact of it being uh, less inflammatory. Anyway, as, hmm. a, as people may know, during a, the production of antibodies, you have class switching that happens, right? From, you know, you have IgM and IgG and other classes. And then you can also have isotype switching, IgG1, 2, 3, 4, that occurred during the maturation of antibodies. And so they wanted to see what was happening uh, with uh, multiple mRNA immunization. So they have people with uh, two mRNA vaccine doses for initially, and they find that most the IgG response is mainly IgG1 and 3, and these are known to be pro-inflammatory. And then they <clears throat> find that uh, months after that second mRNA vaccine, we see more and more IgG4, which are non-inflammatory. And then when you get a third mRNA vaccina uh, vaccination, or if you get infected after that, uh, those first two, uh, that increases the amount of IgG4. And so the numbers are interesting. Uh, among all the spike-specific IgG, they went from 0.04% after the second vaccination to 19% late after the third vaccination. So 19% of the IgG is now IgG4. And they, they don't see this with other vaccines. They don't hmm. see this switch uh, to uh, IgG4. Now, so what what does this mean? So this these antibodies are um, have a reduced capacity to do things um, that are mediated by the FC portion of the antibody, like uh, antibody dependent phagocytosis, where the FC would bind a receptor on a phagocytic cell and it would take up the antibody and whatever is bound to it. So if it's a virus particle bound, it could be internalized with a variety of consequences, maybe destroying the virus or even allowing it to reproduce or activating complement. So these, um, these activities are reduced in IgG4 antibodies. And as the authors say in their discussion, well, first of all, we, we don't know very much about IgG4 and viral infections in general. We really have not studied them, uh, whether IgG4 is important for control or not. Um, but how these this reduction in, and, and the, you know, the, the, these activities, the uh, phagocytosis, complement deposition, these uh, would normally be uh, leading to inflammation. So they're reduced, and that's why we have 
reduced inflammation, non-inflammatory FC mediated effector functions. Um, and they said the people that they studied had no obvious differences in disease. So the people who had mm. infections, they seemed like everyone else in terms of disease, even though they had these uh, an abundance of IgG4 antibodies. And so they basically said, we have no idea how this change affects pathogenesis at all. And so it's an interesting observation and, you know, maybe we could learn in the future what it does, but to, to for anti-vaxxers to grab this and say it shows that they're bad is just so disingenuous, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Well, it's very odd so, because I, I, I guess I don't understand their goal because this would suggest that these vaccines could potentially, uh, that the IgG4 overabundance might make it less efficacious. And so isn't that what they want? I guess I just don't understand the motivation, uh, but that's a well, difference. You know, the motivation of the, the people who are the drivers of the anti-vax movement is to make money selling alternative yeah, therapies, right? right? And right, so right. It, you don't have to have a good um, rationale because most of your audience can't tell if mm -hmm. you're blowing smoke or not, right? right, right, right. They say, mm -hmm. oh, this, this person's an MD and they're saying this is bad, so it must be bad. And, and and we pull our hair out because we know you can't make such conclusions. But right, right. Um, so because I've had computer issues, I'm I'm afraid to click on anything else, <laughs> so I'm not opening it right now. <laughs> um, so I have a question about uh, what they did. Mm. Um, did they look at people who um, had uh, infections instead of vaccinations? Because what it mm. sounds like to me is that you can't tell if it's just the third time around you get IgG4? Yeah. The third time you see the antigen or is it always, you know, did they always go vaccine, vaccine? Yeah, they did. They didn't look at just people who were infected. Yeah, so that, that yeah. I think would be a real Which big now, question is, is it just the third time you see the antigen you get yeah. IgG4? Well, <laughs> it doesn't happen with adenovirus vectored vaccines, right? So there's something different about mRNA vaccines. Um but, you know, to do this study with just infected people now is probably impossible because they can't find them. True. It's not easy to find them. Mm -hmm. yeah. But um, so there's a fundamental difference between what mRNA vaccines are doing and what adenoviral vectored vaccines are doing. That, that's kind of interesting, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. I mean, it probably relates to the types of cytokines that are being secreted um, Mm -hmm. The presentation of the peptide, which is going, you know, yeah. be a yeah, little yeah. different. Do you think it's also to do with the the peptide itself and and how it's generated? So versus just being taken up versus being produced in the cytoplasm by the mRNA, because we haven't really <clears throat> looked at those kinds of vaccines before, and also the right. persistence of the antigen, which I guess people are looking at somewhat, but I'm not sure I'm really familiar with. When you when you get an mRNA vaccine, how persistent is production of the antigen from from the mRNA? We I always say it's, it's short uh, term, but I I don't know what that means because this yeah. is showing mm -hmm. that you know follow up after the second immunization, like I guess that's a week or two later. That then that's when you start to detect these IgG fours. So it seems to you know take a while. Well. The antigen is sticking around, right, in, yeah. the, in the lymph nodes for a long time, right? Um, it's sticking around in the lymph node for a while, but I don't. I think it's actually pretty short term. I I have seen some data on this, but it's been a long enough time <laughs> that I I don't want you to quote me on it. But I think it's actually surprisingly short. Like no, days, I remember you saying in some other podcast we did that it, you were surprised that. What is it? The follicular dendritic cells hold on to it for a long time? Oh, so right. Those follicular dendritic cells may hold on to yeah. it, but in terms of the protein that is directly made by a cell right. that got the vaccine. Right. That's yeah. short. Yeah. That's short. That's I agree short. with that. Yeah. And there might be some kind of extra protein debris, whatever yeah. Yeah. protein that comes out of a cell when that cell dies that goes on the follicular dendritic cell and that will be there for a while. Yeah, I think the actual mRNA is not long lived, right? It's right. it's maybe three, four, five days and then whatever protein is made may hang out in certain places, but most of it's gone. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, very interesting. It's very interesting, yeah. Observation. Uh, let's go back to uh, Cindy. 
Oh, okay. So uh, the, I picked <laughs> two papers. So the second paper- I like paper, your titles. <laughs> I, is on B, oh, I try to be creative, right? So very bad B cells uh, is my <laughs> second paper. So we, we were talking about just like how important B cells are and they're making antibodies and, and we love them and they're so, they're so helpful. But unfortunately, sometimes they're not helpful. And mm. so the, this paper um, was published in Immunity in December. It is called B-cell expansion hinders the stroma epithelium regenerative crosstalk during mucosal healing. Mm. Then the, there are three first authors, Annika Freda, Paula Sarnarski, mm, and Gustavo Monasterio. I don't know if I butchered them. Please accept my apologies if I did. Um, okay. So what do they do here? So this is another like highly technical cutting edge uh, paper that I thought had some really cool aspects. And I also like that B cells aren't always good. So I thought that was interesting. <laughs> so um, what they're really interested in looking at is uh, inflammatory bowel disease. So I think we've talked about this a couple of times. So inflammatory bowel disease is a highly inflammatory disease that damages the intestine. And there are two types. There's Crohn's disease, which affects the small intestine and ulcerative colitis, which uh, affects the large intestine. And there are mouse models to mimic this that are to varying degrees have a variety of different caveats. Some model it better than others. They use the DSS colitis model. Um, this model, basically, you feed or mm. give mice DSS in their drinking water, and it damages the epithelium. So the, epi the, the intestine is made up of one layer of epithelial cells, and underneath is a lot of other cells, including a variety of immune cells called the lamina propria. Uh, and so there, there's all these immune cells, and when there's a breach in the barrier... You might be aware that there's tons of microbes, bacteria that live in your gut. And those microbes that are normally kept in the lumen of the gut now have access to the sterile environment of the lamina propria. And there's lots of immune cells there that can react to these bacteria that get across the barrier. Then they induce the inflammation and that all gets propagated. So there's a lot of caveats to this model and I, I'm not going to get into those, but basically that's how the model works. And you can do this as an acute model where you feed the mice the, the DSS and it causes the damage and you look at the induction of damage and then you uh, euthanize the mice and look at what happens. Or you can feed a little bit lower dosage of DSS for about seven days and then you can take them off the DSS. And they will repair the tissue, and you can monitor repair of the tissue. So they, the mice will lose weight for about 10 days if you feed them the DSS for seven days. So even after you take them off, there's still a little more damage before they start to recover. And by about 14 days, they get back to somewhat normal. And so what did they do in this, and how did they find out that there were something funny about the B cells that were going on? So they used uh, a combination of flow cytometry, single cell RNA sequencing, RNA scope, which I'll mention, um, organoids, and uh, they, they used Visium, uh, spatial transcriptomics, a whole bunch of different technologies to look at B cells. The bottom line, if you take nothing else away, is that there's an expansion of a certain subtype of B cells through type 1 interferons. And these B cells actually impair the, um, the healing. And if you deplete them, they heal better. So how, how do they do this? So they, they do this DSS model and they look at the steady state conditions and they, they look at B cells and macrophages are the two main cell types. And then there's this um, increase in the uh, frequency of B cells over time. Um, so that a dominant cell type is this B220 positive CD and 11C negative B cell population at 14 days. <clears throat> and these stay high until about 28 days. So this is after there's like most of the repair, but they're, they're trying to repair more. And so great. Okay. So there's B cells, but what type of B cells? They do some um, expression analysis to look at what isotypes we were just talking about isotypes. Um, that was IgG and subtypes of, of IgG. But this is looking at IgM and IgD, which are the two antibodies that are first expressed. So if you have a lot of IgM and IgD on the surface, you're 
are naive and if you have uh, some IgD and not IgM or IgM and not IgD, you're kind of on your way to being activated. And if you lack either one of these, we presume you have class switch at this point. And so there is an increase in the number of naive unswitched B cells, but the other populations don't really change. They also looked at the repertoire diversity and clonotype expansion. There's also not a lot of change. So there seems to be some population of B cells that's expanded, that has a naive phenotype that's induced by interferon. Um, so they take this a little bit further um, and they show that by single cell RNA sequencing, they can find these B cells that have an interferon signature. So it looks like they've responded to interferon. And um, they, the, they also increase expression of a gene that's well associated with colitis. So this is called ZBP1, if, you, if it happens to be your favorite gene there. Then they go and look in the tissue because it's nice that you can grind up a tissue and find cells, but are they actually associated with the areas of pathology and do they play any role? So to do this, they use what's called RNA scope. So they can take a tissue that's fixed and they can do um, RNA in situ hybridization that c- they can visualize single RNA molecules in an individual cell so they can figure out which cell is expressing the RNA of interest in a particular tissue so you can look at it in, um, you know, two dimensions in the the slice of tissue. And they find that this ZBP1 transcript that's associated with colitis is in the B cells that are close to the damaged areas and not so much in the other non-damaged areas. And then, of course, that's nice that they're there and, and you can, like, implicate them, but but are they actually doing anything? So to ask if the B cells are doing anything, they deplete them. So the way you can deplete B cells is it's a kind of a cool technology. I think we touched on it before, but but basically mice are, they don't have a diphtheria toxin receptor, so you can inject them with diphtheria toxin and they're just, they walk around, they're happy, they're no problem. You inject you with diphtheria toxin, you're in big trouble. So, so what we can do is we can express diphtheria toxin only in specific cells so that when you treat the mouse with uh, diphtheria recep- toxin receptor, so that when you inject the mice with diphtheria toxin, it deletes just those cells and all the rest of the mouse is fine. And so they're able to express this under a CD19 promoter. And so when they inject diphtheria toxin, they wipe out the B cells any B cell that's expressing CD19. And so in their, if you remember their DSS model, they treat for seven days and then they stop treating and they monitor for another, you know, up to day 14. And so they can inject, inject theory toxin at day nine and 10. So after they stop DSS before they are really in the repair phase up until a day before they harvest them. And they show that they do deplete the B cells, they they drop the level of IgA, they drop IgO, IgA coated bacteria, um, but they didn't have major shifts in microbiota because they also did 16S RNA sequencing in this big paper. Hmm. So no shifts in, my, in microbiota. They also tried to deplete macrophages and had no effect. So macrophages weren't doing anything in this one, <laughs> but it was the B cells. So what they found was that um, that, that that there's better healing and when you lack the B cells, hmm. uh, that was the big finding. Um, and, and they also got some hints from their data. So that this has to do with something about epithelial cell and stromal cell interactions, that when you deplete the B cells, there are more of these interactions and they're able to produce more matrix and to do more tissue remodeling to repair the tissue. Um, so they could see this on the single cell RNA when they had they did this from mice that they had depleted B cells and not depleted B cells. So they have this whole um, single cell information transcriptomic data set where they can show that without the B cells there, there's there's more remodeling and there's a whole bunch of genes that they show are up and and so forth. It's really complicated. But again, that's you know single cell, but. To, t- to take and combine that now and find out where those signatures are expressed, they use Visium spatial transcriptomics. So this is a cool technology too, where you take a, a, a slice of tissue, you put it on this thing, I don't know what it looks like, a cassette, <laughs> and you can basically punch it down and the little pieces of tissue fall into little wells. And then you can throw a barcode into each one of those wells and do... 
RNA sequencing on that well. And that well will contain somewhere between one and 50 cells, depending on how big the cells are and how thick the tissue section is. But in essence, you're getting really close to single cell transcriptomics, but it's mapped already because you, you can tell where you put the barcode so you know which well it fell into. So you can then do you know, uh, bioinformatic analysis to look at where the transcriptomes are across the tissue. And so you can see where, cool. which cells there are, for example, because you can look at transcription, the uh, protein or genes that are highly transcribed in B cells or only transcribed in B cells. And so you can map the B cells to the tissue where they were, and you can map the epithelial cells, you can map all the other cells, and you can tell where the inflammation was happening because you can see the transcription signature go up for the inflammatory genes, or you can see where the repair is happening. And so you can do this in these two-dimensional tissue sections, which is just like really cool. And basically what they could show is that in mice that had B cells that were depleted, there was less tissue damage, there was less inflammatory signature, there was higher repair signature, and there was more, um, more of the epithelial cells and stromal cells <clears throat> that were either in the same well or adjacent wells. So suggesting that there was more interaction between these cells if the B cells weren't there. So the flip implication is that the B cells were dampening the tissue repair and the ability of these epithelial cells and stromal cells to interact. Hmm. And they took it one step further, and that's organoid cultures, which is another cool technology. And they were again able to show that if they had organoid cultures from B cell depleted mice, they had they they had a more regenerative capacity and more epithelial cell stromal cell interactions. And then they, they also tried to take these interferon responsive B cells, knock out their ability to respond to interferon and see what that did in kind of mixed bone marrow chimeras. And it was it was kind of a wash experiment. I'm guessing that that was a reviewer requested experiment and kind of <laughs> flopped. So they still have more to do to try and figure out what the interferon is doing to this population of B cells that seems to be doing bad things, which is inhibiting the repair of the tissue in the intestine. Hmm. Very cool. That's super interesting. And so I, I believe that we have read previous papers where depletion of B cells in these type of diseases is, is not necessarily effective. And so uh, can you, did they mention like, are there certain t uh, time frames, right? Like this was a short term experiment. So maybe in the course of disease, depletion of B cells is beneficial, but then you maybe do need them for long-term homeostasis. They didn't, they did not address the long-term homeostasis. They only did their 14 days and they did sort of a 28 day follow-up. Mm -hmm. Um, it's an interesting question because I think if you had depleted B cells before you induced damage, there pr probably would be an impact, I would think, because there's a, a role for, especially the IgA production in the gut for maintaining the microbiota, right? So right, they would be right. dysbiotic to start with, um, they, but they're just depleting during this window right, when right. the mice start to repair. So. So that's a caveat to the experiments. Yeah. And maybe, maybe you know, like a human translation is like, okay, if, if you're able to uh, quiescent the disease and there is a time when y you know, I, I, you'd have to do a lot more studies in humans, that the tissue is repairing these epithelial or stromal cell conversations are happening, then depleting B cells are, would be beneficial. But then, okay, after that, you need, they need to come back. So it... it it's, I mean, it seems complicated, but are, yeah, are there mean, ways to deplete B cells in humans on the short term, just adding like CD20 antibody or CD19 antibody for sure. depletion? Yeah. One could do that, but does that really efficiently deplete in the intestine? I'm not so sure. Well, that, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, thinking about this in sort of an infection context, mm -hmm. um, you could imagine that there are going to be more B cells present when you are trying to actively, you know, be in the effector phase of the response. And so in some ways you could imagine that that might be a signal of, no, it's not time to repair yet. We're still mm -hmm. getting rid of the, the microbe. Mm -hmm. um, and when the B cells are finally leaving, 
that's sort of a signal of, okay, now it's time to really, you know, make good, do a good repair. Um, and so in that way, this model kind of make, you can imagine that working in, in an infection model, but then of course, um, in places, in models that aren't as infection driven, like these damage models, those B cells can start to cause some harm. Right. Okay. Brian, what do you have for us? Oh, wait. Steph, sorry, Steph. 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 Oh, that's fine. Sorry, sorry. Okay. So I am doing a paper in um, EMBO, molecular medicine. It's entitled A Human Monoclonal Antibody Bivalently Binding Two Different Epitopes in Streptococcal and Protein Mediates Immune Function. The first author is Whale Bonin, and the last author is Pontus Nordenfeldt. And it was just published in December, so just about a month ago, and is along the lines of my wanting to learn more about uh, group A strep. And what they did was they took human B cells from an individual who had successfully recovered from a a group A strep infection. And this is a pipeline that is very similar. You've probably heard us talk about it across multiple different disease types that you would pull out the B cells with some type of hook uh, and like a a pull, you pull it out with a piece of the, the, bacteria itself and they use the M protein um, and they then can sequence the BCR repertoire and identify uh, the the sequences that they can use to make antibodies and then test them in vitro using a variety of different types of assays. They particularly focused on phagocytosis, which is induced by opsonization of the uh, bacteria. And they use a, a couple different ways to test this. And one that is interesting and relatable is you can use heat killed bacteria to set up this assay where you have your antibody binding a piece of the bacteria and by the fab region, which is the top, the, the Y portion, and then the FC portion can bind to FC gamma receptors on phagocytes to um, enhance this um, antibody induced killing of the, of, or engulfing of the bacterium, or you could use, so you could use the killed bacteria, or you could use the live bacteria. And you can imagine that presentation of the proteins and antigens are going to be different. And so you might have a more translational result. And so they employed these different ways to measure the special antibodies that popped out of these B cells that they pulled from the recovered patient. And they found a really interesting antibody that had a very special way of binding to their uh, protein of interest. So I mentioned that the M protein, which is encoded by the EEM gene is very diverse. And it's one of the reasons it's very hard to make a vaccine. There's over 50 different serotypes. But this antibody, typically we think of a fab region being able to bind an epitope, which is a linear sequence um, on the on the protein that can bind in one place. And then its FC region is kind of flopping around. It actually will, they, these antibodies can move quite a bit in space. And then they... Uh, you, the hope is they could bind an FC receptor and engage in that um, activity so the phagocyte can engulf the bacteria or the infected cell. But this antibody can actually bind two at two different places on the pro, on the the protein, the M it's the M1 protein. And what's interesting about that is we think of antibodies being specific. So both regions of the fab of the fab region being specific to one epitope. But what's interesting is this bound two different epitopes. So their sequences are not exact. They're they're not 100% similar, but it is in a conserved region of this M protein. And and they don't really give a full explanation as to um, why this is happening, because I think that's going to involve future studies. But basically to suggest that if you have antibody development and maturation, B cell maturation in a germinal center, you can get some of these very specialized antibodies that are doing kind of funky things, things that you would not think they would be able to do, like bind two different epitopes Mm. on this protein. And what was special about that is this is a region of the M protein that does not typically engage in FC receptor binding to enhance phagocytosis. But when it was bound twice, it could do that which was very uh, interesting to them. And I think why they investigated it further is 
it's helped to stabilize this, the FC. Uh, probably it's bringing that, that antigen closer to, to the uh, phagocyte. It could, like I mentioned, antibodies can kind of flop around in space. And so if you have both sides bound, it kind of, it, it forces it to stop moving around. So then it can maybe find the FC receptor mm. more easily. So it, it is a, uh, a unique antibody that is in kind of this, uh, nebulous group of weird antibodies that have been isolated. Another example is um, from HIV patients. It's called the 2G12 um, antibody. And what's unique about it is you think of this Y, it dimerizes together to be just like this single fab that can bind glycans, which is its unique property. So what I liked about this paper is I learned a little bit more about the M protein not typically inducing phagocytosis, but if you can generate uh, these special antibodies that can be stabilized by binding two different sequences on the same, you know, two different epitopes on the same protein, it was stabilized and did induce phagocytosis. Now, how you can induce the special antibody in an individual, I, you know, we don't know. Like these are like one in a a trillion chance, right, of, of developing these very unique antibodies. But how to do that is so integral to our hopes of getting an HIV vaccine, a pan-influenza virus vaccine, is how do you get these, these antibodies that, for whatever weird reason, are cross-protective, they can bind seemingly different epitopes, which is not how we think of antibodies working. That's really interesting because... <clears throat> um, as before Amy left my lab, she had identified a monoclonal against poliovirus, right? Which is supposed to just neutralize poliovirus, right? But it will it will neutralize rhinovirus, which has a completely different sequence at the epitope. That's crazy. And this is yeah, as you say, this is not how we think it's supposed right. to work, right? Right, right. <laughs> because and maybe you guys could help me work through this. You know, we're envisioning that there are, so in the, in the, the structure of this protein, you know, it's going, there are going to be different spots where the antibody can bind as like those contact sites. That's where we mm -hmm. consider the epitope. But if the, the, if the sequence is different, but maybe the protein presentation is in a particular way that, that at least it can get some low affinity binding, but then the dual binding, if you have two low affinity bindings, does that just stabilize it enough in space that it can engage that FC function? Yeah. I don't know. It, it's very, um, it's, these types of weird antibodies are fascinating and, and it's, I don't think it's clear how they're generated. I don't think uh, it's a problem that, to envision that the epitope could be spatial, spatially mm -hmm. similar, but of a different sequence. Why not, right? For sure, yeah. Yeah, you know, similar charges, similar hydrogen bonding, yeah, yeah. donors and acceptors, yep. but yep. all coming from a, a different... Now, so they the should be able to work that out, right? They should be able they, to work that out with yep. cryo-EM to see and whether do. there's different yes. sequence that have the same structure that could potentially bind. Right. Yep, and they did, they did do some of that work. They have some structure work here, but I think... <sighs> what is the selection in the germinal center for this antibody? Right. I don't like, hmm. I, it seems to be based on this paper and the HIV examples is that these antibodies develop after long-term generation of, and repeated exposure to the antigen. It just, it's, it's something about the time it takes and, Probably the follicular dendritic cells. You know, I'm envisioning that mm -hmm. peptide, that that peptide sticking around for a long time. So, anyhow, very cool paper. Very interesting. To send it to Amy. Okay. Can I ask you one last question on that? So yes. I, I may have missed this, but the M protein, the antibody that's binding, is one antibody binding two sites. Yes. It's or is it? So it's some sort of structural thing that is rigid enough that it only has it can only interact that way in two different sites. So the way that your that your finger is is exactly how their schematic shows it to yep. us that if it's if this is the protein if it's if it's just bound like this it does not engage phagocytosis huh. but the protein it, the structure of it must be it must be the case that this antibody has access to both these sites and then that binding allows for this FC region to really stabilize and engage phagocytosis huh. or stimulate. Yeah. Brian, what do you have for us? 
Um, so the next paper that I have is actually kind of a partner of the one that I talked about previously. The two of them were published back to back in Nature in December. Um, the first author of this is uh, Thomas Hagen, and the last author is Bali Palindron. Um, and the title is Transcriptional, Actus, Accent, bleh, Transcriptional Atlas of the Human Immune Response to 13 Vaccines Reveals a Common Predictor of Vaccine-Induced Antibody Responses. Um, so in this study, um, the authors are again using the um, import um, database um, of um, transcriptional data, looking at 820 healthy adults who had gotten 13 different vaccines um, from these differently published data sets. And again, um, they largely think about um, whether they're getting an adaptive response by thinking about antibody levels. Um, and um, while they have a variety of different vaccine platforms, they don't have any mRNA vaccines. Um, so I already have lots of ideas for things I'd love to know in the future. Um, <laughs> But this is pretty cool. Um, so in the previous paper, um, they were really focused on what the endotype was, what the immune response was before vaccination and how th that um, related to the response after vaccination. Here, they wanted to look at the early events immediately after vaccination. What types of transcripts were made at day one or day three or day seven following vaccination? Um, and how that might relate to the antibody response. Um, and so you could imagine the other paper is sort of go, uh, looking at you before you got a vaccine and trying to determine if you would be a good or bad responder. Here, you might be looking at you at day one after vaccination and determining if you had you know, a good vaccine take um, or something like that. And both of, of these studies also... Um, really are wanting to do this across vaccines mm -hmm. um, to have an idea for a pan vaccine um, signature instead of something that's specific to one individual vaccine. Um, it's a little harder in this study for them to get a pan vaccine signature than it was in the previous. Um, so first, they do see um, things that you might have expected in terms of um, very good um, adaptive immune inflammatory response, or sorry, innate immune inflammatory responses at day one, um, and mostly adaptive types of transcripts at day seven, and intermediate transcripts at day three. Um, at, you know, those types of things that you might have expected. Um, they see um, a fair number of um, similarities between Ebola um, inactivated. Uh, flu, HIV, and malaria candidates. Mm. Um, and, but the biggest thing that they find is that the kinetics are dramatically different from vaccine to vaccine. Um, and it's not necessarily based on vaccine platform. It's not necessarily based on vaccine antigen. They do a lot with influenza using different platforms. Um, and they see that there's always this really major role for kinetics. They end up being able to find kind of a pan vaccine signature, but it involves them having to do a correction for kinetics. <laughs> like you have to know which day that vaccine normally gives you a peak on mm. um, and things like that. And so I think that one of the things that's interesting to me here is that this does show us that things like perhaps that vaccines are not all going to be the same and this, this isn't going to be as easy as we might have expected. But the other thing that's really fascinating in this paper is that among the 13 vaccines they look at, um, one is yellow fever, 17D. And I've always learned the yellow fever vaccine as sort of the gold standard, classic, <laughs> really fabulous vaccine. Um, and if they look at the transcription uh, transcriptomics in response to 17D, they find that it is dramatically different than any of the other vaccines. Mm. And they have a lot of trouble trying to line up anything that they see with 17D hmm. compared to uh, other vaccines. Um, they wonder whether that has to do with uh, pre-existing immunity to other microbes that people don't have to yellow fever or things like that. And they really sort of are unable to figure what it out. What type of vaccine is the yellow fever vaccine? Uh, the yellow fever vaccine is an inactivated. Mm. No, no, it's attenuated. Live, live, yeah, live attenuated. Live attenuated. Yeah. Where they, yeah. Okay. 
Um, so you sounded like Siri when you asked that question. <laughs> <laughs> Hey Siri. <laughs> hey Siri. Um, so, so, so do you think that it has to? Do, I mean, I'm I'm not familiar with how that virus replicates and expresses its proteins. But I mean, does that? Do you think that that has to do with its kinetics? Is they seem to think that a lot of this is con- based on kinetics. Okay, and then particular to <laughs> the yellow fever, and in particular to the yellow fever. Okay. Um, they they talk about how they can sort of get the yellow fever data to um, correspond to the other pan vaccine signatures with corrections for mm-hmm. kinetics. Mm-hmm. Um, but what I think is really interesting to me is that we think about the yellow fever vaccine as being so fantastic, and this really highlights that that vaccine still is pretty unique. Yeah, yeah. And that vaccine is doing unique things, and that if we could actually learn what this signature is and why they're getting such a unique signature, that may help us in understanding how to get a great yellow fever vaccine but, or a great vaccine for anything else. But then is the challenge to that, because we're basing this off of antibody titers, and so then efficacy is is pathogen dependent. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I actually, to be honest, like this paper paired with the other paper, mm-hmm. Because it shows that you aren't always going to get a clean answer. Can't always get what you, you want. You sort of <laughs> a nice systems um, type of experiment. Yeah, yeah. Um, the you know the other one I felt like there was sort of this very clean. Okay, there were these fourteen genes and the endotypes, and we can definitely see something cool. And here we learn mostly about the complexity of the immune responses and understand some areas of complexity that maybe we didn't realize were as key. Um, maybe, you know, this one h- tells us about kinetics as really driving these responses in a way that we didn't know that the kinetics were going to be as big a deal. And did they try to... Put, oh, go ahead. Uh, I'm surprised they didn't put the polio vaccine in here, which is a really mm-hmm. good vaccine also, you know. Yeah, I think it's based on what was available in the database. Hmm. Yeah, hmm. probably. Okay, did they sorry. try to look at the endotypes that were in the other paper and how that influenced the response to the vaccines? They did not look at that here. Mm-hmm. They no. need to get together, these two groups. Guess <laughs> you said there were a lot of overlapping authors, so I just wondered if they addressed that. Maybe that's their next paper. they're using the same database. Hmm. Maybe that'll be their next paper. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. I, I wonder whether they worry about um, numbers and power yeah. when they start to do... That much so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Fascinating. Do, do you think this kind of integration is entirely valid, considering that the data may have been obtained under really different conditions? Well, so their argument. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll give you their, their argument yeah. about that. Um, their argument is that in using this study, where they're looking at more a larger number of people than mm-hmm. have been done mm-hmm. before and in a wider variety um, of people than have been done before is m- perhaps more generalizable than in a study done with a smaller number of people in a particular, say, geographic region or something like that. And so the argument they're trying to make is, no, that actually helps us because we can get rid of some of the bias from whatever may have come in from an individual study. Yeah. But yeah. you're right that it becomes really hard mm. because there is so much variation. I guess one of the systems well. biology arguments is the more data you collect, the mm. more it coalesces, right? Because it's yeah. it's sampling, right? If anything, you flip a coin, right? The more times you flip it, the closer you're going to get to 50-50. And right? then at least you they can correct for said thing in their analyses. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I don't know enough about the bioinformatics, but it seems like, you know, just saying, oh, okay, so we think time is an issue, so we're just gonna correct everything and kind of normalize <laughs> it and then look. I don't know. There's you're probably losing some yeah. important information there. Yeah, no, I think that that's that is very true. I, like I said, I like the idea that we're these types of approaches can have us find answers, but they also sometimes show us complexity. Yep. Mm-hmm. For sure. Okay, let's, uh, my turn. Cell reports medicine paper. It's very interesting. Impact of SARS-CoV-2 exposure history on the T-cell and IgG response. 
Okay, so they have a cohort of people, 190 people with different kinds of vaccination and exposure histories, right? Mm -hmm. They have one exposure, which is either vaccinated or infected. They have two exposures, either two vaccines, a vaccine and being infected. Three exposures, you, you can figure it out. Two vaccines and an exposure or one vaccine and two exposures or four, two vaccines and two exposures. And the question is, what does that do to the antibody and the T cell response? Very cool. So they measure uh, like ELISA, the IgG response against spike and nucleocapsid. Nucleocapsid, of course, you can do in the infected people or vaccinated and infected, but the nucleocapsid comes from being infected. And they do T cell responses as well, spike nucleocapsid. Cool thing is T cell responses don't go up with multiple exposures. Hmm. They're pretty much high at the first and they stay high. And the antibody, this is a magnitude. This is total antibody now goes up with the uh, number of exposures. I, th I think that's very interesting because mm -hmm. it is my feeling or my understanding that, and, and Daniela Weisskopf talked about this with us on TWIV last week. You know, the T, cell, the T cells are giving you good protection against severe disease, even if you're getting infected because your antibodies can't handle some new variant. The T cells are still good. So... That tells me you don't need to keep boosting every year because it doesn't have any effect on the T cells. I think that that is true <laughs> in a healthy mid-age population. I think where people who don't want to think of themselves as older, but their T cells are telling them they are, yeah, yeah, that sure. they do need, you know, I think that any... Uh, I mean, I think other things like diabetes and general inflammation can decrease initial T cell responses. So the flip side of that would be if you are somebody who thinks your T cell responses are compromised, then you would probably benefit. Maybe, maybe. I mean, I don't know how long you will benefit from a booster. Say you're seven, if you're elderly, elderly, 75 and up. I don't well, know how long it's going to last. If your T cell responses are less efficacious and then you have to maybe rely more on your antibodies, at least if you can get yourself antibody boosted so that you can help your T cells out during those months when we're coming together. Yeah. I think that's why like, there's not great vaccine coverage in nursing homes and they're experiencing pretty large hospitalization outbreaks. And so I think it gets in those populations, I think that it is definitely important. I think, as Paul Offit said, it's better to have a plan that is, you know, a six-month boosting is not a public health plan, but having Paxlovid or Remdesivir available is, because as you know, the 500 people dying in the U.S. every day, right. less mm -hmm. than 1% get Paxlovid for various <laughs> reasons, because the right. doctors think there's this thing called Paxlovid rebound, or they don't believe in it, or whatever. That would be a way to save lives of people who can't mount good antibody or T cell responses, you're, you know, so. Yeah. You definitely think, need a multi-tiered yeah. approach, I think, for these populations. But I just don't struggle. think that this idea we're going to keep boosting every six months, I don't think that's viable. And I think this, anyway, this is, these are healthy people for the most part. Anyway, the, um, the other, the other part that's interesting is if you have a combination of infection and vaccination, uh, you have uh, a greater breadth of, your response compared to vaccination only, and you have more polyfunctional CD4 cells compared with spike only, vaccine only. So something about being infected and <clears throat> vaccinated is very good in that sense. They say they call it hybrid immunity, as many other people do. Hybrid immunity induces more polyfunctional spike CD4 cells than vaccination only. So some some things to think about, and maybe you know, as you're designing new vaccines, to keep these in mind and as a goal. Do they look for IgG4? <laughs> no, they didn't. <laughs> they did not. No, they just look for total IgG. <laughs> but, you know, next time they do it, they will. Yeah, right? some self-class analysis All would right. be good. That's cool. All right, let's move uh, back now. Let's see. So, uh, Cindy, Steph, you have a third one, right? Okay, yes, I have a third one. <laughs> it's a very interesting study by 
Oh, uh, what is his uh, Openshaw? No, I gotta pull it up here. Uh, out of the of the Peter Openshaw's lab uh, at Imperial College of London. This is an RSV human challenge trial. Mm-hmm. I find these human challenge trials very interesting. They seem to happen a lot in in England and um, in the UK. I, I don't know if there's just a precedence from you know early days when they were doing challenge trials, but there seems to be a lot that come out of that group and. What I, I actually just saw this paper today. I was on another call and it's just very fascinating. So I'm going to scroll down to just a couple main points. When they were looking at the response to a human challenge trial, whether they had symptomatic infection or asymptomatic. So whether they had a cold or no cold, because these are healthy individuals, they were not challenging immunocompromised or older individuals. And so their clinical outcome is just, you have a cold with symptoms or you don't. And those that had a cold, the predictors, the biological processes that were predictive of that uh, symptomatic response were to do with neutrophil activation, neutrophil immunity, neutrophil degranulation, and different molecules that are secreted from neutrophils. So that was a really big uh, takeaway is that if you have an overactive neutrophil response, you are more likely going to have symptomatic infection uh, to RSV. In addition, and I can draw your attention if you have the paper open to figure five, they show you this panel of a multiple different chemokines and cytokines. So they interfere on alpha and gamma, CXL10, IL-15. There's a bunch of them. And the typical trend that is observed in all of these different molecules is, and there's a couple that are different, but if you have a decrease at the beginning of your infection to... Uh, if you have a decrease in any of these molecules at the beginning of the infection, but then you have this massive ramp up later on in infection, this is like day seven, that you are more likely to have symptomatic infection. Whereas individuals who had no cold, either their interferon alpha, for example, or other molecule was flat or increased at the beginning of infection, they did not have this like big peak later on in infection, which related to symptoms. And so innate immunity matters so much for the controlling of initial viral infections. And that's very clear here in this healthy population of people that were RSV infected. There were a couple of interesting cytokines like IL-8 and IL-1 beta where the trends were different. So if you did not have a cold, you actually increase in the, both those cytokines and they kind of remained higher. So maybe that has to do with um, controlling the virus, but things like interferon, even IL-10, TNF-alpha, IL, um, IL-6, if you can have a quick blip of this particular molecule, think I'm thinking this has to do, okay, you're going to control infection. You don't have this like massive immune response and that immune response is what's going to correlate to symptoms. So innate immunity, I mean, it is, if you don't have that, it's, it's really difficult to control these pathogens. It's a big, the biggest uh, risk factor for severe COVID, right? Yeah. Crappy. And it's hard because you can't, I mean, these are not things we typically think we can manipulate. Like you either have your response to these things are innate, right? You, there's not your, your endotype is your endotype, endotype is your endotype. So for my innate immunologists, and that would be Brian and Cindy, how do you think of innate immune responses and our ability to harness them? I mean, is it kind of just like whatever happens happens or what do you, how do you think of that? Hmm. <laughs> I th- yeah, I mean, I think a little bit about things like, you know, the adjuvants mm-hmm. that we're putting in vaccines yeah. and some stimuli like that. Um, but I think that that's the place where we know the most. You know, people are coming up with some ideas on the trained immunity side mm-hmm. of ways to harness innate immunity. But I, I'm not sure that we fully understand that enough to, to do much. Yeah. There's a lot of polymorphisms and things in innate mm-hmm. genes that may have subtle effects that combined would mm. change your initial response. I don't know. And I think, yeah. you know, your history as well. So if you've recently had an infection or recently had a vaccine or recently had an exposure, maybe that you didn't even know you got infected, you could have tickled your innate immune system and mm-hmm. maybe it responds faster. And so 
we, you know, even the endotype, we don't know necessarily the whole history of those individuals and whether they have to do with different diseases that they have or different exposures that they have. Um, and that might influence or, or where other they are. environmental exposures or diet. Oh, environmental Pollution. exposures are huge because they yeah. dramatically impact. And 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 scarily is it, environmental exposures that happen in utero that mm-hmm. years later impact mm-hmm. your disease susceptibility and things. We ju- we really are just starting to scratch mm-hmm. the surface and understanding how those impact the response. I think mm-hmm. this is really cool though that it's. It, we don't typically think of neutrophils being involved in the viral infections, but that signature is so critically important for determining the outcome yep. in this yep. in this disease. And just as a side note, neutrophils are very hard to study, correct? Because <laughs> you so so for um, B cells and T cells, we isolate out peripheral mononuclear cells and we freeze them down and we can thaw them and they're yep. generally still active and can perform their effective functions. Neutrophils, you have to use them the day you isolate them. Yep. You cannot freeze them because yep. they, they're dead. Once yep. They're not going to be recoverable. So in neutroph- I, I think neutrophil science is, is a bit more challenging in that way. Um, mm. if and and do it's human, very so. difficult to study neutrophils in mice. Because yeah, you don't really? get a lot of blood. So in humans, you can get right. a lot more blood and, and neutrophils make up a large percentage of the peripheral blood mononuclear cells. And so you can do studies with them if you can collect them and, and do them that day. Right. But yeah, they're so also, my, I mean, you look at them sideways and the, right? they get, <laughs> they're really easily activated and they shoot out all kinds of inflammatory factors that then influence their neighbors and things. So yeah, they're hard to work with. Brianne. Um, so the uh, third paper that I have um, is uh, from Science Immunology. Um, the first author is uh, Sarah Klassen, and the, the senior author is Ruth Lay. Um, and the title is Silent Recognition of Flagellins from Human Gut Commensal Bacteria by Toll-like Receptor 5. Um, and this paper gets at a really interesting question um, in the field, which is that we have a lot of innate immune receptors, like many of our toll-like receptors, that respond to um, molecules that are part of microbes. Um, But they're part of microbes that are both pathogenic microbes and they're part of commensal microbes. And so how is it that we are not making an an innate immune response or an inflammatory response to those commensals all the time? And we're not kind of um, in the midst of one of these responses all the time. Um, here, they're specifically looking at the receptor TLR5, which binds to flagellin, um, the major component of the bacterial flagellum. Um, and they uh, decided to look at the um, human gut um, sort of microbiome data, and they looked to see um, if there were flagellins encoded by members of the human gut microbiome. And they assumed that there would be. And in fact, um, they found a lot (laughs) of them. Um, And they particularly found that they were made by a group, the Lachnospiracy. Um, And so they um, actually um, expressed 40 of these different flagellins um, recombinantly that they had found. Um, And then when they made these flagellins, as well as using a positive control of the salmonella flagellin and a couple of known negative controls, um, they looked at the ability of these flagellins to bind to TLR5. And they also looked at the ability of them to uh, lead to um, some signaling. So they looked at their ability to activate TLR5. And... um, when they did that, they found that the different flagellins could uh, fall into three different groups. Um, one group bound to TLR5 and signaled, kind of like the, the salmonella flagellin that we know about. Um, they saw some that couldn't bind that seems to evade, and they'd known about some of those before. But they also found another group that could bind to TLR5, but not signal. Um, and these were largely from their commensals, um, from this one particular uh, group, the um, Lacnospiracy flagella. And so they found these flagella that could bind TLR5, 
um, and not signal, and they called them their silent flagellants. Um, and they used this to look at some structures, um, and they found that there was an additional domain in the uh, flagellants that signal um, that actually bound to TLR5 slightly differently um, and led to some different signaling. Um, and they also found that this led that they could see these flagellants in um, uh, micro uh, in data from human stool. So these are clearly being produced, um, and they are influencing um, TLR5 binding and potential signaling. Um, one thing that they didn't really do here, or one thing that I thought would be really interesting, is that they they talk about TLR5 signaling, <laughs> um, like sort of one specific activation pathway. And so I would wonder whether perhaps they're getting maybe a different type of signal transduction with the silent the silent flagellants. And so maybe they're seeing something more immunomodulatory um, instead of more inflammatory. And so I think that that's something to look for in the future. But here they've basically shown that there are these different types of flagellants in commensal organisms that don't lead to the traditional TLR5 um, stimulation because, in fact, there's an extra part of TLR5, uh, an extra epitope in TLR5 or an extra binding site that they didn't know about hmm. before. And this was a tour de force, but did they actually take that extra epitope and then add it in to the mm -hmm. silent ones and make them non-silent or delete them from the active ones and make them silent? Yeah, they, they do that. They do individual mutations mm -hmm. of different mm -hmm. parts of the mm -hmm. epitopes. I mean, they, they do a lot of really nice biochemistry. Cool. Very cool. That's very cool. All right. Last one is uh, one that is um, not SARS-CoV-2. <laughs> it's this fundamental immunology. It is a cell paper out of uh, Charlotte... Viant's laboratory and as, as collaborators at the Rockefeller. Continuous germinal center invasion contributes to the diversity of the immune response. So as uh, listeners may know, um, when, uh, when B cells encounter antigen, uh, it's presented to them and they begin to uh, undergo cycles of expansion and maturation in the germinal centers of the lymph node. And so um, the, uh, the antigen is on the follicular dendritic cells and the B cells are selected that bind that. The ones that can't bind, they're, they're gone, they're fired. <laughs> the ones that can bind uh, go back and they go, undergo cycles of somatic uh, hypermutation to make even more high affinity uh, binding antibodies. And they go through multiple cycles and that's how you get high affinity uh, antibodies. And so uh, this, this paper is all about understanding um, the, the, whether these germinal centers continuously recruit uh, naive B cells, right? Um, it, it's known that um, B cells with low affinity uh, antibodies can get into uh, lymph nodes, right? So if, if you have a high affinity, you, you, you get a ticket to go in. But even if you have a low affinity, uh, you can you can get in in the absence of competition with if there's no high affinity uh, B cells to begin with. So in this paper, they want to know whether these germinal centers are continuously recruiting B cells and how that contributes to diversity. So they they use an antigen from HIV one to do lineage uh, tracing experiments, uh, and uh, they can track uh, B cells that go in and. Um, <laughs> what they find is that um, naive B cells continuously enter germinal centers, right? So naive means they haven't yet bound uh, uh, an antigen. Um, and there in the germinal centers, they compete for T cell help with the other B cells and they go undergo clonal expansion. Uh, and these late comers, it's like someone coming in late to a concert, right? <laughs> they still can get in. They have fewer mutations they can constitute 30% or more of the cells in, in these late stage germinal centers. Uh, these cells diversify the immune response because they have receptors that have low affinity uh, for the immunogen. And so 
what we find is that the, the affinity threshold for getting in, right? So you need a, a high affinity ticket is lowered when there are already high affinity antibodies in the germinal center. So they're like, we're really good. We're going to let some young <laughs> B cells in and give them a chance. <laughs> they have lower affinity so they can get in. It's kind of like you know, a, a high powered laboratory. You know, <laughs> we're going to let in some people who haven't done very, very much because we're going to train them and they're going to be good scientists. And so that's what I look at this, that you can let these B cells in that, have, that make low affinity antibodies and, um, help them uh, diversify the antibody response. So I'm one, I'd love to hear your immunologist take on this. Well, <laughs> uh, there's, a, there's a couple of things I'm thinking of, uh, you know, particularly in regards to, okay, so if we think of this from an infection or a vaccination perspective, do those rates of invader B cells coming into the terminal center matter for how divergent the sequence of that peptide is. So I haven't read, admittedly read this paper yet, but are the invader B cells responding to the same protein that the high affinity B yeah. cells responded to? Okay. Yeah. Hmm. Well, they're thinking. naive, right? R the invader B cells are naive, right? Right. Yeah. I understand. Yeah. Um, Does this fit with so what we've heard from like Gabrielle Victoria's work? Because In I what thought, sense? I thought that, uh, he was saying that what you get like one clone dominates. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's why I'm, I'm trying to put this into context of what we were uh, from our conversation with him in the different papers I've you right. know we've seen. I I believe so. Although, okay, so looking at this like schematic, they're they're showing. Oh, I gotta get all the way back up here. Um, one germinal center. You're right. It's a little. It's a little bit different than maybe what we, what uh, Gabrielle was, Gabrielle was showing us, and and that it's, there's not one particular clone that's dominating. Mm -hmm. um, but it is. I mean, it does agree with this idea that it can be harder uh, to, upon subsequent, and like you have this issue of uh, antigenic hierarchy or original antigenic sin and that you, particularly if this, if the proteins are, are similar, that it's hard to recruit those higher affinity ones because you, you, you have this issue of these other inv invader B cells. Um, yeah. I, what else do you guys think about this? Well, could those invader B cells um, provide kind of more coverage yeah. against further mutated versions sort mm. of as, as you know, that gives you another opportunity to start somatic hypermutation mm -hmm. um, and, and really broadens your ability to respond I mean, to variants. The, the key is if you can have a lot of naive B cells coming in and then it would do that, right? If you're originally, my understanding is they thought, oh, well, only a couple of B cells can go in. So that's going to limit your diversity. Right. But here mm -hmm. they find that they continuously go in. Right. And right, that's right. gonna yes, that's gonna do what you say. It's gonna give you a broader coverage. Mm -hmm. And my understanding, again, I haven't read this either, is that some of this is based on the affinity of that original. That's right. correct. Yes. Right. Right. Yeah. So apparently, the having high affinity antibodies in the germinal center is uh, is the ticket to letting in the others. Right. So the system has evolved to allow diversification. Right. Right, right. Because if you just wanted high affinity antibodies, that would limit <clears throat> what um, what your coverage is of antigen. But now, right, you, right, what you can respond to in the future. Yeah, so you're right. Yeah. If you think of things through, why would it do that in evolutionary context? That does make make sense. Makes sense, right? Yeah. And yeah. it's kind of like your example is really good. If if science is going to continue, you got to let <laughs> new new yeah. naive clones come in and learn right. otherwise I mean we do that all the time right you get right. people who don't know what you know and they don't have the techniques yeah. and you say it's okay you can come in we're going to diversify the field absolutely mm -hmm. right yep. and many with just different ideas and different people and so forth it's a great analogy right, yeah. <laughs> right. this the analogy breaks down very much here so I'm not going I'm not going to continue the analogy on this part but you could also imagine that if you have a lot of low affinity B yeah. cells, 
in the germinal center, then those might already be more diverse or you, you haven't made it to the point where you have a good high affinity antibody yet. So you don't want to start letting in more naive B cells. You want to continue working with those low affinity cells that you yeah, have. So I think that, that with the breath that you have from those low affinity cells. Yeah, I think the key is that you have to have established high affinity producing right. cells before you let this in. Yeah. Well, actually, Brian, that makes sense because if you don't have the high affinity or the established scientists, you, it's, you can't teach yeah. the next generation, right? So that's you right. can't dilute uh, the top true. out. Okay. <laughs> so, so right. Yeah. That's, no, it's very cool. I, I mean, the work, and correct me if I'm wrong, Gabriel was trained by Nuisance Y, yeah? Yeah, he was, yeah I yeah, believe he so, yeah. yeah. He was at Rock and then he left. He went to right. MIT and then he came back, yeah. Right. So... Of course, for, from a vaccination perspective, it can be challenging because we want high affinity. Like that's all, you know, we focus so much on high affinity antibody responses. So it's, you're working against the system. Um, yes, absolutely. In, in regards to that. Uh, well, are you if, you, if you get high affinity, then you also get breath. Well, I think... I mean, like the 30 mRNA HA, the influenza, pan-influenza vaccine is okay, going to take yeah. advantage of the system. But if like you have one spike and you're trying to develop like very potently neutralizing antibodies against this one thing and you wish your germinal center had like all of that, uh, yes. you know, was filled yeah. with those, that's, I guess, not. So, so mm -hmm. you're right. I mean, it, it could play in our favor for a pan-corona or pan-flu vaccine. It just, it's going to take time, right? Like that, yeah. yeah. So Vincent, did they talk about how these might be able to compete? Because my understanding is when you're, you know, you're checking your affinity and things, you're going to be binding to whatever antigen is available on follicular and dendritic cells, and you're competing for the ability to see that antigen. And if there are high affinity ones around, their on-off rates will be biased in such a way that they're more frequently associated with that. And so it's going to be harder for those low affinity ones to, to enter into that play yeah they do they do talk about that right um i i don't think they have a solution for how it works though mm -hmm. if i remember mm -hmm. yeah i mean it's a um, great idea to bring them in but whether they can actually yeah do anything once they're in there it's going to be hard to imagine hmm. all right there you go that does it for today Yes, that was great. That was fun. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, a little little brief summaries are are fun, right? We learned yeah. a lot. You can definitely tell that we are, on, you know, we do a, a bias on the infectious disease side of things. I was thinking to myself as I was mm. collecting my papers, I'm like, I should do something cancer related, yeah. but you know, it's not my cancer is my wheelhouse. But I'll try <laughs> to stretch myself. Well, I'm, I'm impressed that two of you did bacteria this time, <laughs> right? I, I haven't yeah. heard. Yeah. Of Bacteria on immune for a while, but that's obviously <laughs> should be. But cancer is another one, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Or, or really, this last paper is a is a fundamental yeah. thing. It just doesn't matter what antigen you use, right? Correct. Right. It's fundamental yeah. questions. And and I'm not suited for it because I don't know the history enough to really appreciate it, but it seemed like it was a that was good. An important well, thing. All right. That's paper. episode 64, When I'm 64. <laughs> <laughs> that's a song. Yes. <clears throat> Who's that by? Neil Young? Beatles, no? Beatles. Beatles. Will you Beatles. still need me? Will you still feed me when I'm oh, 64? Boy. Of course, 64 now is young. Not that old. I know. <laughs> Very <Yeah>. young. <laughs> All right. You can send questions and comments to immune at microbe.tv. Uh, if you, uh, by the way, the show notes are at, at uh, microbe.tv slash immune. You can get links to all the papers. Questions, comments, immune at microbe.tv. If you enjoy our work, we would love to have your financial support. There are lots of ways you can do it, you know, including giving us money, or you could hook up with Amazon and they will give us a fraction of your purchases. It doesn't cost you anything. It's called Amazon Smile. So you can just look it up and you pick us as the charity. And whenever you buy something, you know, if there's some of you out there that buy a lot of Amazon stuff, <laughs> give, give, it, give us the fraction. It doesn't cost you anything more. So there are lots of ways you can do that. Microbe.tv slash contribute. Cindy Leifer, Cornell University, at Cindy Leifer on Twitter. Thanks, Cindy. Thank you. <clears throat> you have a lot of snow up there? No, 
I, a little gone? bit, but I, it was ice today. I almost mm. slipped coming out of my driveway. Mm. It was very icy. I did, I did a twin yesterday and Jason Shepard in Salt Lake City, they got five feet oh, of snow. Yeah, they got pumped. Wow. Get yep. dumped on. Steph Langle is at Case Western Reserve University. Stephanie Langle on Twitter. Thanks, Steph. Yeah, thank you. This is fun. How's the new lab? All good? Yes, uh, it's great. We, <laughs> I have, I've hired a couple people. I have um, uh, another person coming, maybe two more people. What I underestimated is how long it takes to do like everything. So like MTAs, transferring grants from another institution, IBC protocols. Everything takes a long time. And a lot of it is like, I can't do it myself. Like this, these forms, I have to have many layers of people filling them out. So that's <laughs> what I think I'm frustrated with, but it's going good. No, it's going great. Loving it. So I, I arrived in my lab September 1982 at Columbia. And I did my first experiment in January of uh, 83. So it's not bad. Oh. Okay, that's not bad. That I'm, but that is what I feel like. I'm like, oh, am I going to, hopefully I'll get to do experiments sometime soon. But I didn't have any grants to transfer. This is 1982. There were hardly any forms to fill out. That's the beauty yeah, of Yeah, you were shortly started. after mouth pipetting, so, you know. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. <laughs> yeah, but it's great. Thank you for asking. Brianne Barker is at Drew University, Bioprof Barker on Twitter. Thanks, Brianne. Thanks. I learned a lot. I now have a long list of papers that I'm ready to go read. And I promise I know that the yellow fever vaccine is live. <laughs> I'm, sure you, I'm sure you knew. It was just a misstep. It's okay. <laughs> I'm Vincent Yellow. You can find me on Twitter at Prof VRR. Music on Immune is by Steve Neal. Thanks for listening to Immune, the podcast that's infectious. We'll be back next month.